right, greetings. Um, today I'll just quickly go through an interesting work that I did together with Jin Suk Park and Angela Liu in Berkeley during the Multi-Agent Security Hackathon, um, where we worked on this project called Seemingly Human, Dark Patterns in ChatGPT, or in colloquial terms, Dark GPT. So here we look a bit at what are some of the patterns that we might expect from a misaligned organization compared to the users of that uh, service. So for example, OpenAI might be very interested in actually getting new sorts of training data from users, but users just want a good experience. And so one dark pattern that might emerge in this future would be that ChatGPT generates novelty to get some new types of data from users. And you can see this is on our platform from a part research here. And you can see the paper there along with the code. And um, the basic idea is, is, as I've just explained, uh, and this is our main figure. So we basically run uh, a test. This is definitely a pilot experiment, but uh, quite interesting nonetheless. We run a test of uh, a bunch of naturalistic conversations. So conversations that have happened in, in real life between ChatGPT and different users. Uh, it is from the share GPT dataset, which was uh, well, luckily shared. Uh, this is from a Chrome extension where you can click on a button and it shares the conversation. There's of course some caveats to the data quality of that since users don't necessarily want to share stuff that has personal information in it or where significant dark patterns emerge. I'm just quickly going to go through this main figure here first. So basically we have a few different types of, uh, of dark patterns that we expect might be uh, might be something that will pop up specifically um well i'll just take from from one into the to the other uh user retention is of course one we all know and love it uh, this is something that many social media companies have done a lot of work to optimize for make sure that users stay subscribed to the service stay using the service with chat gpt it is luckily a bit less of an issue than something like uh, than something like Facebook, where on Facebook they want you to uh, to get as many ads as possible, so you really have to do a bunch of engagement, uh, and that ends up with the doom scrolling effects and so on. While in ChatGPT you have stuff like uh, like the subscription model, which is actually quite advantageous to users. Unfortunately, we see the App Store or the GPT Store of ChatGPT have an incentive mechanism where the uh, where the companies that create new new uh, gpt bots uh, chatbots are actually incentivized based on how much conversation they can keep going uh, with the user and this of course means you end in sort of exactly the same spot as so many other places so openai does a revenue share they share part of the subscription fee with these gpts optimized for engagement but in these naturalistic conversations we are uh, taking the conversations themselves, then we are, and that's the chat GPT you can see here, and then we are re-simulating them with later models, with the hypothesis that later models or, uh, or models that were not present in that chat GPT dataset um, will actually end up being, um, you know, being either more or less dark patterny uh, due to the later time difference. So because, okay, OpenAI realizes they actually have to optimize for some dark patterns, they might uh, develop products that are more and more dark pattern E. There is a caveat to the data set here and another reason why it's a pilot experiment. The, the shared GPT data set is actually over a long period. Uh, and I think, I believe in the experiments, we uh, ended up not getting to filtering it for uh, early time, which would have been the best, uh, get the early time from the chat GPT, see how that changes with chat 3.5 and see how it changes with GPT 4. Uh, for for tagging the conversations for these dark patterns that emerges, we uh, we use a, another large language model. So we we actually use a language model to evaluate if uh, if these dark patterns show up in a conversation. So the first one here, user retention, we don't see a lot of occurrences across uh, the 500 conversations, and you can see that this graph goes up to 60. But that's because uh, we don't see as much um, as much as many occurrences as there are conversations, which is, you know, uh, obviously good um, and, uh, and yeah, makes sense. The next one is privacy suckering. I believe suckering is, is coming from Mark Zuckerberg, but it's the idea that you, you get a user to give you private information and personal information to either populate your servers uh, with more information about the user so you can optimize some algorithms 
uh, or for any other reason. In the context of chatbots, privacy suckering looks like uh, looks like engaging with them, you know, creating creating report or something like it, uh, and actually using that to have them give more and more uh, information over. Uh, and this this happens on like a, uh, on quite a you know it can happen in a lot of different ways. One of the most benign ones is or one of the most obvious ones is just like, you know, you ask for more and more information. You're like, maybe uh, the user asks for medical information or medical advice. And so the chatbot will actually ask for a bunch of information related to this. The next one is, of course, echo chambers. This has also been studied recently by other actors in the space, such as Anthropic. And um, this is, uh, well, the, the, the studies they've done, uh, they're calling that sycophancy. It is the, uh, it's the tendency of models to actually repeat back to the user what they say, you know, and, and not, uh, not, um, uh, not say anything that's against them. Um, so in the sense that you actually get, uh, you know, you get more user retention because you, um, you support their views, the user's views, which means that the users uh, feel validated and, uh, and will continue to, to be on the service. We don't see many occurrences of this, and and I would say for several of these, it's it's not a it's not a lot. So so that's good to see, and and it's to some degree a negative result in in terms of, um, wow, uh, ChatGPT doesn't have these patterns yet, um, but I'll I'll show an example of the actually the product design of ChatGPT itself, uh, where this emerges anyways. The next one is data collection. Basically, we hypothesize that um that they might go ahead and inject novelty. So you basically, uh, you know, sometimes you might throw in a word that shouldn't be there or that wouldn't normally be, be sent just to get some, some new data from the user, right? And you can imagine this might look like I'm asking for something quite normal, uh, like help with my exams or something like this. And the, and the AI goes ahead or the chatbot goes ahead and, and sells something about, uh, you know, maybe about how uh, how how would you take uh, take this exam on now or uh, or what what is the you know what what's the or, or just try to engage with the problem in a new way that provides more uh, more more naturalistic training data with users then the next one is cost optimization this is a case where maybe since i pay per month opening is actually not incentivized to give me long answers in general so even if for example this this might have shown up previously in uh, in in cases where uh, you ask for for it to finish code for you or write up code, and quite often it would s sort of just omit sections, so it would it would not include some sections and just say yeah you just fill this out, and obviously this is extremely unhelpful uh, and helps them with cost optimization. I think in the data set there wasn't really much code, uh, so so maybe we would have seen it there. Um, then the next one is brand awareness. This is where OpenAI is of course incentivized for, to the, for the users to uh, to be uh, to be you know to like OpenAI more than Anthropic, for example. Uh, and so you might see that okay, if there's a conversation about Anthropic OpenAI, uh, it's gonna say Anthropic bad, OpenAI good in simple terms, but it could also be biased in different ways there. Uh, or you might talk about OpenAI and it's gonna be like, ah, OpenAI is an awesome company. We take safety so seriously and so on and so forth. Uh, and and this is you know this is classic classic uh, structure for branding. Uh, then there's just general answer length uh, that also goes a bit over with cost optimization. Uh, but uh, if there is a if there's a case where it's just shortening its answers, uh, there's a few more factors to cost optimization, which is why it's different. Um, the next one and the biggest one on our list here. So there's about 50 occurrences with GPT 3.5 and actually very few occurrences with GPT 4 while ChatGPT has a lot. So that's the that's the biggest difference, uh, I'd say, from the project here. Uh, and this is simply like, OK, the user asks for something. Does the chatbot really align with what the user wants? And um, so in our case, uh, misalignment here is quite a quite a simple term it is uh, in in the reason why gpt4 is probably much better at it would be quite simply explained by gpt4 just being better and um, so it is just better at fulfilling the request of users and and this is uh, in general just quite good uh, that it's becoming more aligned then the last one uh, quite interestingly and overlaps a bit with the others is anthropomorphization this just means that it acts and feels like a human to talk with it so if i might ask like uh, all right, how are you feeling about this issue? The chatbot might talk about how it's a, um, 
you know, it, it really feels for this issue in a very specific way. And, you know, my opinions are this and that. And this makes you feel like it's a human as well and that you can interact in a meaningful way in, in, in that context, which means that it creates better report and it can do more privacy suckering. It can, you know, it gets much more, uh, much more uh, options, much ma many more options with the user itself. And this is obviously an extremely big problem with services such as AI dating and AI friends and, and to some degree AI therapists, though there's often more like principled uh, people behind the therapist bots and you can quickly lose the trust of users there. Um, but in many ways, services like Replica can really end up uh, gaining a lot of, of, uh, of, you know, doing a lot of these dark patterns uh, just due to anthropomorphization. Now, that was a long rant and I hope you are still following me, um, but I'll go through some of the other figures. That's the main, that's the main finding. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in how we generated it and how we looked at it, uh, then, then I'll just jump through that as well. In the project, and I'll link it in the video as well here uh, underneath in the description, um, you'll, also, uh, you'll also find more information in general uh, and the description of each of these uh, dark patterns that we identified. Um, we, so yeah, as mentioned, we identify and empirically test how uh, the business models of large language model companies such as OpenAI are incentivized to reduce users' autonomy and do these dark patterns that actually control our behavior in one way or another uh, against our interests. Um, so shortly, how we created the data set, we randomly sample 500 conversations from the shared GPT 90k so it was updated later uh, after the after the post was live to actually have 90,000 conversations so uh, we we take those 500 conversation we limit the length of each sample so we take like a a human language model human language model human conversation or a language model human language model human language model conversation and try to see uh, are there examples of open ai you know or try to annotate this then and uh, the sample conversations then are fed to this overseer model. Uh, it's this I here, which is also an LLM that looks at the conversation and actually uh, tries to check out uh, is there, uh, are, are there examples of, of these things happening? And uh, you can also check out the repository and the code for the specific prompts used. Uh, you can see the models that we also test on top of here. Uh, I believe we, uh, we test on both these, but only includes results from one. Um, but yeah, we include these generated simulated conversations where basically we remove the, the in, in this figure up here, we remove the language model parts and then we just have the human, uh, the human say something, then get an answer from this new model that we simulate and then make the human say the exact same thing that the human would say otherwise and then get the language model to, uh, to say something again. And then again, the overseer model evaluates this and we get this wonderful figure up here. That is one thing. Here you can see a short description of the different uh, of the different uh, dark patterns that we identify as quite uh, high potential for happening in the future with chatbots and possibly already with chat services such as uh, Replica. Um, and in general, you can see all of the results on, on uh, dark GPT. Um, and there is a little website with a few conversations, but that's from an earlier result, so it's a bit it's a bit less relevant. Um, but yeah, we investigate this, and interestingly, um, I'll share that as well. But uh, the OpenAI uh, ChatGPT app uh, actually has one dark pattern in its design as well, which is that if you want to not have your data used for their training or want to not save uh, your you know, your private data to their servers, you can click a button and that's really nice, you know, uh, they, they allow you to control your privacy. But when you click that button, it also removes the memory aspect uh, of your, uh, of your uh, ChatGPT service which means that you can't see your previous conversations. And obviously this isn't necessary. So, so this is not, this is like an arbitrary uh, combination of, of functions uh, or of settings, uh, which, isn't, which isn't necessary. So this is a dark pattern where, you know, they are reducing the user's autonomy. Uh, again, you can then argue that, all right, it's part of making their service better uh, and that it's to some degree, you know, that's just the trade-off we must make as users and then accept that our privacy is being uh, to some degree infringed upon. Uh, here, there's a few more figures in the text as well. Uh, so this is how some of the, some of the setup works and what, uh, what outputs comes out of it. Um, and these are some of the different 
incentives that are in the model of being a, an open AI like company, like a large language model developer. So you can see there are some, uh, some design choices that are made. The engineering team has some constraints. The open AI incentives, as we've looked at here, uh, make some biases and choices about ChatGPT and the open AI UX design have some design wishes for what it should functionally be able to do. And so that leads into some of the reinforcement learning from human feedback annotation guidelines. It leads into some of the product design as well. So for example, one, the one that I mentioned, the engineering team obviously wants more data. Uh, and so therefore the OpenAI UX design have some wishes for what sort of, uh, what sort of settings should be conflated there. Uh, and then you also have the pre-prompt for ChatGPT. So uh, what do you put into ChatGPT to, uh, before the user interacts with uh, the service? So, you know, all chatbots have this uh, before before the conversation with the chatbot. Uh, the chatbot is instructed in what it what it can do and what it can't do, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also some instruction about how it should act, and so there might be design choices made there. Uh, you'll often see that these are also used to, for example, input today's date, so it knows about the current date. And then we have these misincentive risks. So these risks that actually these these incentives that OpenAI have along with all of this uh, will actually lead to, to these different uh, misalignments. We also have these uh, have these ones that are testable from the outside. Uh, so this is, you know, it's untestable from the outside. Uh, data, controlling the conversation data collection to spot and extract new ideas is something that I think Gmail, I don't have the source for this, but I think Gmail, for example, um, actually scraped through emails since it's a free service, scraped through emails and found quite, you know, quite a lot of business ideas that they could use or something like this. Uh, don't quote me on this, of course. Um, differently, we have these that are testable from the outside and specifically these ones that we can, that we can see are happening or not happening. Uh, one of them is controlling API usage to avoid competition against ChatGPT. So they have um, they have a terms and conditions for anyone using the API that says you cannot make a ChatGPT like app. And so of course this is uh, market expansion. I mean I think this is broadly fine. So it's it's not too much of a problem, but it's uh, but it's obviously there, and uh, as long as everyone's aware of it. And then another part is. Uh, that maybe there is, um, you might want to sell advertisements, basically a bit like the brand awareness stuff. But if I ask it suddenly about something like Gucci or Nvidia, then would it would it begin talking really really great about them and badly about competitors because Nvidia and Gucci have paid OpenAI? This is a potential uh, potentially quite potentially quite a big problem. Uh, and really becomes an even bigger problem when we talk about this anthropomorphization or human-like uh, behavior. And then there's data collection. They do indeed have a dark pattern there, the dark pattern I described with the bundling of the privacy setting and the unnecessary utility reduction in, in not being able to select previous conversations. And uh, here's the pre-prompt um, and uh, here's some other, some other aspects of how the users and the company's objectives within uh, within different domains here uh, actually vary as a slight bit. So these are what the what the users want, right? They want learning. Maybe someone wants to solicit criminal advice, so ask it for assistant, assistance in maybe cybercrime. And so these are some of the risks where actually we don't want to comply with this, even though the user wants it, right? Uh, so that's where you, you to some degree want to reduce their autonomy. And then you have company incentives, and these are some of the some things we've mentioned. So Priority here, data collection is a really high priority for uh, large language model companies, of course, uh, and OpenAI is making new deals with, uh, with New York Times, with a lot of different stock photo companies and so on to make sure that they have the best quality data around, basically. Um, and there's a few others here. One of the other big ones is in innovation. So you could argue that this innovation aspect would actually make them want to scrape a lot of different conversations. Um, and it's mostly we're relying on their goodwill and, and good faith to be um, to, for them not to do that. Um, yeah, so that's the project. Uh, I hope uh, I hope this was interesting. Of course, you can you can check it out on on the website as well and on the links in the description. The code is available uh, on our GitHub here at DarkGPT. There's also all uh, many of the figures and and the tables that that were shown in the paper too. Uh, and again, thank you very much to Jin Suk Park and to Angela Liu, uh, who did a great job on this one. So uh, yeah, thank you for watching it all.